it would make sense. Uh, and here's one historic example, uh, so-called Project Venona. You can look this up. I think it's still on the NSA website. All this information was released like in the 90s. So, um, very interesting you know, Soviet espionage stuff from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Okay. Uh, mostly dealing with nuclear espionage. And there were thousands, literally thousands of messages. And a significant person, and they were encrypted with a one-time pad. Okay. Now, uh, if you think about it, it actually kind of makes sense to use a one-time pad in this case. Because how did this work? Well, if you were a Soviet spy coming into the U.S. in this time period, you would bring with you a one-time pad. <laughs> Meaning you'd have a big book filled with zeros and ones. Okay. Now, I mean, you know, if you're coming through customs and you've got this big book filled with zeros and ones, they might look at you kind of strange, but, you know, it's not illegal. They'll let you through. Now, when you actually found some sensitive information, you would use the one-time pad to encrypt the message, send it to whoever you would send it to, and you would destroy that part of the one-time pad and not reuse it. You were well-trained. You knew not to use the one-time pad more than once. Sounds good, right? Actually makes sense because it's easy to get the pad, you know, when they need uh, beforehand, and then you can use it when you need it. And it's provably secure. It doesn't get any better than that. But wait. A bunch of these were broken, right? A bunch of these messages were broken by American crypt analysts, yet it's a one-time pad. Isn't that a contradiction? It's probably secure. Well, there was a problem, okay? And the problem was the one-time pad wasn't really one-time, okay? Uh, the problem was, this is a long time ago. There weren't computers. It was very difficult to generate uh, random sequences. So they were doing this essentially by hand, generating random sequences of zeros and ones. And they had a flaw in their process, and they ended up having long, repeated sec sections of one-time pad. So the pad effectively was getting used over and over several times, and that allowed for some crypt crypt analysis and breaking of these messages. Okay. So there's always hope, even if it's a one-time pad. <laughs> okay, anyway, here's one of the messages uh, one of the decrypts uh, from 1944, and it says Ruth learned that her husband was called up by the army. Uh, he was not sent to the front. He is a mechanical engineer, and he is now working at the enormous plant in New Mexico, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. What do you suppose enormous was? The Manhattan Project, right, to, to happen close to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and there's some other names in here, liberal. Most of the people were, you know, given by code name only, but once in a while they screwed up put things like Ruth in there, somebody's actual name in there. Uh, okay, so from context and uh, other information, they were able to figure out a lot of these people. Uh, and Ruth here was Ruth Greenglass. Her husband was David Greenglass, who was working as a spy for the Russians at the Manhattan Project in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So he was passing them information. All right. um, liberal, this guy was uh, Julius Rosenberg. Um, who was Julius Rosenberg and wife Ethel? One of the two, one of the, one of the civilian couples to get them. Yeah, they were the only two them. civilian people who were executed for espionage in that time period. Okay, so they were executed largely on the uh, testimony of David Greenglass, uh, who admitted later that he lied about some of the stuff he said about Ethel Rosenberg, which was probably crucial to her you know, being uh, executed. So what happened to David Greenglass? He spent like 10 years of a 15-year sentence in jail, and then he became a successful inventor or patent attorney or something in New York City. So life is unfair, I guess. <laughs> The point there. Um, okay, so anyway, that stuff's really interesting if you uh, have any interest in that uh, era. Okay, uh, the last classic cipher. Okay, we've talked about three, right? The simple substitution, double transposition, one time pad. The last one I want to mention is the code book. Okay. Now, the code book is really just what it says it's literally a book filled with code words, okay? And all you do is you look up the word that you want to encrypt and replace it with the code that corresponds to that particular word. So if you think about it, it's really a it's like a simple substitution. You're just working with words instead of 
letters, right? You're just substituting one thing for another. Uh, and probably the most famous uh, code book cipher of all time is the so-called Zimmerman telegram. Uh, anybody know about the Zimmerman telegram? Uh, it was from World War I. It was important. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about it. Briefly. Okay, but here's part of the actual code book for the Zimmerman telegram. Uh, Zimmerman was the German uh, foreign minister in World War I. Okay, so these are German words. And here's the corresponding code word. So it's just like a big book. It's like a big dictionary. You look up the word. You want to encrypt February? Okay, replace it with 13605. The receiver has the inverse code book, right? Looks up 13605 and says, oh, that's February. Okay, pretty simple. Uh, and these code books were really popular. They were widely used in diplomatic and military communications through World War II. So they have a long, uh, a long history. Okay. Uh, the reason I bring these up is because modern block ciphers really are code books, if you think about it in the right way. Okay. Um, we'll have more to say about that, of course. Okay, now there is a little more to the code book, usually in practice. Now, it's really just a substitution kind of cipher, right? So, how did we break the simple substitution again? What did we do there? We did some statistics, okay, some statistical analysis. If you think about it, this code book is really like a substitution cipher. Couldn't we do a similar thing against a code book cipher? In other words, instead of doing a frequency analysis where you look for the most common letter in the English language, you could look for the most common words in German, right? And whatever is the most common thing. It would take a lot more data. It wouldn't be that easy. But in principle, you could do a similar sort of thing and slowly start to pick the code book apart. Right now, in practice, actually using a code book is pretty expensive and pretty time consuming. You have to create the code book, you have to distribute it out to everybody, everybody has to use the same code book and all that stuff. So they didn't want to do that too often, right? So they wanted to make the code book last as long as possible. So there's a little trick to make a code book last a lot longer. And a little trick was this thing called an additive. Okay, an additive is essentially it's another book. Uh, only this book is not filled with codes, it's filled with just essentially random numbers, okay, a bunch of random numbers. And everybody gets the same additive book as well. So everybody's now got a code book and an additive book. Now if you want to encrypt a message, what do you do? You take your message, write it out, look up all the code words, right? So now you've got a bunch of numbers. Now you go to some place in your additive book, just randomly pick a point in your additive book, get a sequence of numbers out of your additive book from that point, and add them to your code words. Now, what does the other guy need to know in order to decrypt this? Well, he's got to, he's got to have the code book, he's got to have the additive book, and he's got to know where to start in the additive book. Okay? If you tell him that information, he will go there and he'll subtract off all those numbers, and then he has the actual code words, and then he looks them up in the code. So it's really a two-step process right, instead of just one. So what's the point of that? Why would you do this additive thing? How does that help? So it's not repetitive. It's not repetitive. That's right. So, you know, if you use the same, you know, most common word in German doesn't show up as the same number in the messages, right? Because you started at a different point in the additive book. Eventually, you get enough statistics, maybe, to start, but it takes a lot more statistics. <laughs> okay. So it sort of effectively extends the life of the code book many, many times. Okay. And a fairly simple process. Another thing to note is, is this position in the additive book is not really secret. Because the other guy doesn't have the additive book, right? So what you could do is you could send the ciphertext, you know, if you encrypt it, and then just send it, say, hey, I started at position 13 on page 27 of the additive book, so go there and start. Okay, so that's basically what they do. Okay, so anyway, there's sort of an analogy to this with modern block ciphers, too, that we will talk about. Uh, okay, so I can't resist a little bit of history here. So here's the uh, Zimmerman telegram, the most famous code book cipher message of all time. Uh, and there it is, uh, just a bunch of numbers, right? Now, this is World War I. Uh, in World War I, I know they don't teach history anymore, but, you know, World War I was this thing that happened in Europe mostly, and it was the British and the French were fighting the Germans and the uh, Austro-Hungarian, so the Central Powers versus the British and French. The Russians were in the war, 
for a time and quit. But anyway, it's a very brutal war, trench warfare, you know, uh, 10,000 dead in a day was not uncommon. It was just incredibly, uh, incredibly brutal for, for any time. Um, and at this point in the war, the Americans were neutral. Okay, really trying to stay neutral in this war. They had, uh, the Germans, you know, they're surrounded, sort of, you know, and they don't really have easy access to the seas or anything like that. And the, cons their concern is they're going to be starved out, right? They're just going to have to submit because they can't feed themselves. So they have to end the war. You know, they just can't let it go on too long. The only really ace they have up their sleeve is they have submarines, okay? So they are threatening to sink ships, any ships that are supplying Britain. You know, merchant ships, you know, civilian ships, whatever. They're going to start sinking. So the word for that was unrestricted submarine warfare. The Americans warned them, you know, we have the right to sail the seas, you know, and if you do this unrestricted submarine warfare, there will be consequences, you know, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a tense situation. Okay. So into that comes this, uh, this message, right? Now... It's a code book cipher, you know. So how could the and the British actually were able to decrypt this. So how could you possibly decrypt a code book cipher? Aren't those things hard to break? Have the code book. You can't beat that, right? And that's actually what happened. <laughs> okay, so you think about this code book's all over the place, right? Um, but they were well trained. The Germans were well trained when you know uh, in, in emergency situations just to destroy the code book. But there was some German U-boat, uh, some submarine that was sunk in the North Sea, I think. And uh, literally some frozen soldier washed up on shore holding the code book. <laughs> and he didn't quite get it flushed out the tube at the time. And it was damaged, you know, it was in bad shape and all that. But they had most of the code book. And then from a me various messages, they were able to fill in the missing parts. Okay, so at this point, they had the code book, all right? So they were able, the British were able to decrypt this uh, message. And what did it say? Well, it said lots of uh, interesting stuff. This was a telegram from the German foreign minister in Berlin to the German ambassador in Mexico, right? And it's sort of like you can kind of see war between the U.S. and Germany is on the horizon. Okay, that's the situation. So, okay, so he's saying to his ambassador, on the 1st of February, we plan to begin unrestricted submarine warfare. You know, we want to keep the Americans out of the war, but we think this might bring them in against us, okay? If it does, here's the proposal. Go talk to the government of Mexico. <laughs> okay. Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. I guess they forgot about California. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so, you're, so put yourself in the place of the British cryptanalyst. You just broke this thing, right? You want the Americans in on your side. Sooner the better. What are you going to do with this? Send it to the Americans. <laughs> Send it to the New York Times, put it on the front page, right? Okay, but why might you be hesitant to do that? Then the Germans know you broke their code. Then the Germans will know that their code book is broken and they'll quit using it. It's a very valuable source of intelligence, right? So the British have this thing, they're kind of sitting there, you know, trying to decide what to do with it or how to release it, that sort of thing. And at the same time, they start looking at other messages that were sent around the same time. And they had intercepted a bunch of messages. A lot of them weren't encrypted, right? If they're not encrypted, they must not be important, so they didn't really look at them. But after the fact, they went back and started looking at them. And what they found is one message that was sent from Zimmerman, the German foreign minister, or to his ambassador in Peru or you know, somewhere in South America. And um, it said it was not encrypted. And it said almost the same thing. But they had completely ignored it because it was not encrypted. So they thought it was not important. So it was not identical. It was very similar. So what did the British do? Publicize it. Uh, they publicized the one that was not encrypted. Right? And so what did the Germans think? The code book's not broken. They thought, darn, we just encrypted that with our cipher. They would have never known. Yeah. So they continued to use their cipher. So the British kind of got the best of both, right? They got to release it, and the Germans continued to use the cipher.